Welcome to our discussion around the 2023 General Assembly and its impact on Kentucky's kids. Uh, let me begin by recognizing uh, three different entities. First of all, I want to thank Aetna for their continued support of these virtual forums. Uh, you know that we did a lot of that leading up to the session, kept you posted during the session, and uh, that simply would not have been possible without the very generous support of, of Aetna. So thanks to them. Secondly, uh, I cannot begin uh, today's conversation without recognizing my colleagues, uh, the work that they did, uh, the, the really difficult job of uh, persistence, and frankly, having courage as well as smarts as we think about the 2023 session. Uh, I just wanna take a moment and pause and I uh, hope you give them a virtual round of applause because I can tell you they deserve it. And thirdly, uh, I wanna thank you. Uh, we had an unusually uh, vigorous engagement from our partners. That certainly was true on Children's Advocacy Day and Children's Advocacy Week, but it was true uh, on a consistent basis across the entire session. And uh, I just wanna reiterate how important that is. I know that, that sometimes it's easy, isn't it, to think that uh, ah, my voice doesn't matter. Well, in, in fact, it matters a whole lot. And uh, you guys get an A plus for taking seriously your role uh, in trying to create a vibrant democracy. So as we think about the 2023 session, the easy thing for me to do is to give you the, we had successes and we had losses, and here's an example of each. But my colleagues have uh, told me that's what they're gonna do. So I have to come up with something different to say. And uh, I can just tell you the message that I'm going to be uh, sharing today in subsequent media appearances and probably in any number of rubber chicken speeches uh, that I'm gonna be making uh, post session is that I believe the most important things that we can take away from the 2023 session uh, are three vital meta narratives. And I don't like any of the three. Uh, the first one that I would suggest to you is that we now have seen Kentucky policy in Frankfurt nationalized. That began last year uh, with the public benefit package that really was simply a carbon copy of what was going on in some 22 other states. That trend line on any number of issues continues. Uh, I've got to tell you, that bothers me uh, because many of you know that I am old and decrepit. It means that, that I have a long memory. Uh, I know what it was like in 1990 when Republicans and Democrats came together and created a national standard for school reform that was Kentuckyized. And that's not just 30 years ago. In 2014, we created a standard for juvenile justice reform that didn't exist, but it was Kentucky lawmakers who invented that. As late as 2019, when we as a nation were struggling with school safety, the late Bam Carney and Senator Max Wise created the School Safety and Resiliency Act that was hailed as an original creative approach to that difficult topic. So that the legacy, the legacy of the Kentucky General Assembly is that Kentucky leaders create unique solutions for the context of Kentucky. Folks, that has changed because suddenly folks in Colorado Springs or Topeka or Alexandria, Virginia, they're the ones deciding what laws are gonna be passed in Frankfurt. That means that national, uh, often obscure dark money groups are pulling the strings in Frankfurt. So that is a meta narrative that we need to continue to watch. I mean, folks, when we see maybe three dozen other states 
enact bills that are realistically identical to Senate Bill 150? I mean, do you really believe that lawmakers in 36 states all got the same idea at the same time? Or do you think that maybe, just maybe, somebody is dictating where the action is going to be? So the nationalization of Kentucky policy is one meta narrative that I want you to hold on to and I want you to think about. The second meta narrative is what I'm calling legislative vertigo because it makes me seasick. And that is that there was a time when, whether it was a Democratic controlled House, Republican controlled Senate, or currently Republican controlled General Assembly in both chambers. But all of those groups had certain core pillars that, that were governing principles. Whether the issue was K-12 or taxation, child welfare or economic development, there were certain principles that were brought to the table. Now, you or I may have agreed or we may have disagreed with those principles, right? but they were applied in a consistent way. That train has left the station. There are no more consistent governing principles. We learned that last year when we watched the General Assembly, which for years had talked about that, that there was one principle on education policy, which was local autonomy. It's what principals and superintendents and parents and local board members wanted. That's what drove the day. Last year, when it came to school safety, that was an inconvenient proposition. So suddenly Frankfurt dictated what was happening in your community when it came to school safety. So we learned last year that school, local school control is really important unless it's not important. This year, Another example flared up, and I think it was so profound, and that's the issue of parent rights. What we saw was the General Assembly absolutely uh, laser focused on ensuring that parental voice was crucial when it came to curriculum and library books and what topics were covered and what weren't covered. And I got to tell you, and some of you will disagree with this, I, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. I, I think that for too long, parents probably have not had uh, an authentic voice and influence in how their kids are educated. So don't hear this as an attack on that. But yet, in the same bill, as well as companion pieces, what we saw legislators say was that when it came to other aspects of how kids are cared for, parental rights don't mean anything. We know that in Senate Bill 150, instead of honoring parental rights, what we heard was that not only do health professionals not have a role in children's health, but parents have no rights to control health care. Well, from where I sit, I mean, you can have it one way, or you can have it the other way. You can say that we accede to the judgment and expertise of professionals. So teachers and librarians, they're the ones who need to dictate curriculum and library books and health professionals. You're in charge of kids' health care. That's one line of argument. The other line is that parents become pivotal. What I have difficulty with, where that vertigo comes from, is when parent rights are really, really important in the library, but there are no parent rights when it comes to certain facets of healthcare. So the nationalization of policy, legislative vertigo, the other trend line, and uh, I'm probably gonna get in trouble on this, in fact, I know I'm gonna get in trouble on this, is that I'm very concerned that a really key element in pushing good things for kids has become uh, diluted. And that is the role of caucus leadership in both the House and Senate. 
I've got to tell you, one of the things that, that we counted on so strongly for so many years is that when the chips were down, we knew we could count on leadership in both chambers to say, this is something that's good for kids and we are going to make it happen. Or this is something that is bad for kids and we're not going to let it happen. I did not see that this year. In, instead, it was literally the wild, wild west. And that may be because uh, a plethora of new members. It may be that both caucuses, the majority in both caucuses, have tilted strongly to the right. I, I don't know the dynamics, and I'm not going to act like I can figure that out, but I can observe the impact. And the impact of diluted legislative leadership is a diluted agenda for kids. And that is not a good phenomenon. So nationalization of policy, legislative vertigo, and a dilution of the leadership function when it comes to kids' issues, that's my takeaway. And frankly, my concern as we already begin looking at 2024. But do not despair because my colleagues are going to take you on a more positive tour. They're going to talk about certainly some things that were left on the table, but you are going to hear an array of really good things that happened for kids. And it's important for you to hear from all of us, but for me especially, that we do appreciate that fact. We do know that there were legislators who stood up and showed courage. There were legislators who stood up and showed creativity. There were legislators who stood up and showed commitment when it came to our kids. And for that, we should be appreciative and we should let them know that we noticed and are appreciative. So to get to that side of the uh, today's agenda, a little more deep dive, a little more positive than I just gave you is Dr. Shannon Moody. The other thing I just need to say publicly is that Shannon clearly was our quarterback uh, on the 2023 blueprint. And uh, man, she deserves a most valuable player because uh, she did that with grace and adroitness. So Shannon, thanks for the leadership you gave during the entire session and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Terry. And um, certainly a major, major team effort on our part here at Kentucky Youth Advocates. We're gonna take just a minute um, to do quick introductions of our policy experts here around the table. Um, and as Terry said, he gave kind of the big, broad meta narratives. Uh, we're gonna get more into the nitty gritty of um, Senate bill numbers and uh, details around particular policies that we were keeping an eye on, that we were championing, that we were watching and hopeful would move, but maybe didn't. So we're gonna talk about um, some of those wins um, in spite of you know what Terry had mentioned around some of the bills that we know are harmful um, or will potentially be harmful for Kentucky's kids. Um, and then also talk about what we're looking forward to in 2024. So again, I'm Shannon Moody. I oversee our policy work here at Kentucky Youth Advocates, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Crystal. Thanks, Shannon. I'm Crystal Willis, and I focus on juvenile justice policies. Now I'll pass it to Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Vanover. I focus on early childhood education with a secondary emphasis in the K through 12 education system. And I will pass it to Tamara. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Tamara and I focus on child welfare policies and I will hand it over to Karina. Thanks, Tamara. My name is Karina Cash, and I'm a policy analyst focused on economic security, and I will pass it back over to Shannon. Thanks, Karina. And unfortunately, our colleague Alicia Watley could not be here. She is our health policy guru, and I know Tamara's going to be stepping in to update on some of the health policy work that we were involved in and that was on the blueprint for Kentucky's children this legislative session. So, um, 
Uh, if you're not familiar with the faces around the table, I'm sure you will be uh, in the coming um, sessions. And uh, and if you have further questions, I would encourage you all to reach out to the individuals around those particular areas. Um, but we're going to jump in. Uh, you know, Terry had alluded to the uh, Senate Bill 150, and we did see some um, some troubling trends um, with specific bills, but also some of those meta narratives. But we did see some really positive movement on behalf of Kentucky kids. Um, you know, and there are there were bills passed that uh, we championed that were on the blueprint, and we want to hear a little bit more about. So, um, how did kids and families in Kentucky uh, win with the 2023 General Assembly this year? And I will pass it over to Tamara Vest to talk about some of those child welfare wins. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, so we had a couple child welfare wins this session, and one of those was Senate Bill 229, and it was sponsored by Senator Adams, Yates, and Carroll. And it was to close gaps in reporting by ensuring that the reporting of child abuse and neglect is properly communicated to the appropriate external agencies and clarified that agencies cannot use the chain of command maltreatment reporting process. And the bill also allowed DCBS to initiate an assessment or an investigation when child abuse or neglect was suspected and allows discretion to make announced or unannounced home visits depending on the severity of that case. So it helped reduce those gaps in reporting as well as providing opportunities for relationship building between DCBS and families by allowing them to identify families who needed support and resources rather than investigations. And the bill was signed by the governor on March 27th. And another one of our wins uh, was Senator Mayor, this sponsored bill. Uh, it was Senate Bill 48, which established an independent ombudsman office for the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. And this bill was signed into law on March 29th and helps ensure that reports are being investigated to their full extent without conflict of interest being in a now separate department uh, from the secretary's office. Hey, I'm happy to jump in, and I am so excited to report that Kentucky Kids and Families saw two really major wins on the economic security front. Um, the first win I'm going to talk about is House Bill 21, which was sponsored by Representative Randy Bridges and makes several updates to Kentucky's homeless ID law that will make it easier for all homeless individuals to obtain that really vital piece of documentation. Um, the piece I want to highlight specifically today is a way that it'll support homeless youth who are unaccompanied by an adult. So starting in 2024, this bill will allow unaccompanied homeless youth age 16 and up to obtain an ID without their parents' permission and allow them to effectively establish a life for themselves. We know that that parental permission piece has been a massive barrier for these youth as many of them are either fleeing violence, have been involved in the child welfare or juvenile justice system, um, or just don't feel safe being at home with their parents. So this bill will really be a huge front to allow them to kind of start their life independently of their parents and um, establish themselves. The second win I am excited to talk about is an update to the Kentucky Transitional Assistance Program. Um, that program provides direct cash assistance and work support service to Kentucky families living in deep poverty and kinship caregivers. And this is the first update to the program that Kentucky's made since 1997. Um, we have information going over all of the updates that were made to the KTAC program on our blog at kyyouth.org, but some of them that I want to highlight are an increase in KTAC's benefit amount. Um, we adjusted the amount benefits are for inflation, and um, we also increased eligibility so that more families living in deep poverty can access this really vital program. Um, they made some changes that address the benefits cliff and then also strengthen the work support services that KTAP offers, such as increasing um, the amount of relocation and transportation assistance that families um, receiving KTAP can get. And I will pass it over to Crystal to talk a little bit about juvenile justice. Thanks so much, Corinna. Um, yeah, there was definitely a pretty heavy focus on juvenile justice this session, um, but we did end up with two wins that I'm happy to talk about. Um, the first one is Senate Bill 162, which was championed by Danny Carroll, Senator Danny Carroll. Um, and what this bill does is it maintains a centralized data tracking system for the Department of Juvenile Justice, so it makes it a little bit easier to track juvenile recidivism. It also provides children in detention facilities 
um, access to privileged conversations with mental health professionals when they're in crisis. It allocates some necessary funding to provide salary increases for workers in detention centers and also to hire some additional um, youth workers as well. And then it also provides a little bit more funding to do other things such as security upgrades to detention center buildings and a few more. Um, the second one was not necessarily on our blueprint priorities at first, um, at the beginning of the session, but House Bill 3 uh, was tricky and the General Assembly really did come at this juvenile justice issue um, with open minds and listening ears and that led to some wins within this bill um, that did seem pretty far off at the beginning of the session. But what this bill does is require the FAIR team, the Family Accountability Intervention and Response Teams, um, to take action on truancy cases within 90 days. It allocates some funding to the Jefferson County Youth Detention Center to, retro to be retrofitted to accommodate for 40 additional beds, um, and then also some funding to renovate uh, the Jefferson Regional Facility as well, um, and to cover some transportation and staffing costs. Um, it does mandate that children who are taken into custody for violent felony offenses are detained for 48 hours, but this piece also includes proper access to qualified mental health professionals, um, as well as allowing outside agencies such as nonprofits um, or churches, religious organizations to come in and get connected with youth to give them the opportunity um, to find something to connect with within their community. So we were happy to see some of those wins within that bill. Um, and I will pass it over to Sarah. So this session, we didn't have a lot of early childhood um, bills that were proposed due to the fact that we are waiting for next year for a big year with appropriations behind it. But there was a joint resolution, House uh, Joint Resolution 39, that is going to have an impact on child care and some of our other um, areas that the cabinet supervises. The uh, resolution is basically asking that in the upcoming months, the cabinet will put together a anticipated budget of what it would cost to keep the child care assistance program changes in place that were created during the one-time COVID funds, as well as um, asking them to adopt a benefits cliff calculator and to develop and start to implement an earned income tax for families. So the, the joint re uh, resolution was definitely a a big step forward, and then we'll be looking forward to more early childhood education uh, bills in the next session. And then I think Tamara is going to do another update. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to go over some of our health focus uh, policy wins. Um, one in particular, Senate Bill 135, which built on momentum from 2022 in supporting the health of new moms and their babies. And this bill ensures education on perinatal mood disorders, uh, making sure that's available on the Cabinet for Health and Family Services website, as well as evidence-based screening tools and ensuring collaborative efforts to address disparities in care and improve maternal health outcomes. And I will pass it back to Shannon. Thanks for that, Tamara. And I know um, Senate Bill 135, sponsored by Senator Funky Frohmeyer, um, was something that we saw um, in a previous session, and we're really glad to see back in and get through successfully. And I think that what we heard was a commitment to other maternal health related areas of focus because it's such a, a key area of getting um, um, getting to that success for both kids and families early and often. Um, so I appreciate you all outlining some of those wins. I know that our blueprint um, policy agenda um, is generally pretty um, robust. And I think uh, at the end of this session, a, sort, a short session, we saw um, a lot of great things move through for kids and families. So we're really excited about that. But I also know that things got left on the table. Um, we know that um, there were some missed opportunities this session that um, we saw some movement on or, or were hopeful that we would see some movement on that just did not make it across the finish line. And we know that there are a lot of variables that can impact that. Um, but what what were those missed opportunities based on your all's perspectives related to um, kind of your focus areas um, that the General Assembly maybe could have moved on and, and didn't um, for several reasons. 
So within the juvenile justice arena, one missed opportunity was Senate Bill 158, which was sponsored by Senator Givens. Um, this bill would have allowed for a contract with a third party or an outside entity um, separate from Department of Juvenile Justice to do a full performance review of DJJ. Um, and so this not this um, non-biased review would be of pre and post adjudicated facilities and programs uh, within Kentucky with workforce protections put in place to ensure that interviews with employees would be kept completely confidential. Um, and then there would have been like a report due in October. Um, this bill would have allowed for a really nice deep dive uh, within some issues that DJJ is facing and would really help to examine and highlight those and what's causing them. Um, but Senate Bill 158 advanced all the way to House Appropriations and Revenue, and it did die there. Um, but another missed opportunity is minimum age that a child can be adjudicated. Um, it was really sad to see that this one was overlooked again, um, and especially disappointing seeing that juvenile justice was such a hot topic. Um, but this bill has been brought up for many years, and although many states do have a minimum age, uh, Kentucky still didn't pass that this year. But we are hopeful that they will come back next session and take a better look or take a deeper dive into this one. Um, I think legislators are really starting to see the value in a lot of the juvenile justice issues, so we're hopeful for next session. And I will pass it over to Tamara. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, there were a couple child welfare um, bills and, you know, ideas or priorities that we did not see um, make it to the finish line during this session. And one of those in particular was House Bill 288, uh, which nearly made it there, but not quite. Um, and it would have ensured that public and certified non-public schools complete initial background checks and obtain reference checks of potential employees from previous employers. It would also require applicants to disclose if they had been the subject of an investigation, allegation, disciplinary actions, resignation, or termination regarding sexual misconduct in the past year, and require training for educators on appropriate communications, sexual misconduct, and grooming. Child sexual abuse and grooming goes underreported every single year, and Representative Tipton's bill would have created more pathways to ensure adult-child interactions in schools are safer and more appropriate. There was movement on the bill again, um, unfortunately did not make it where it needed to be, but hopeful for next session that we see that again. And one of the other missed opportunities that I wanted to highlight in child welfare is House Bill 440. Um, it was filed but did not move, I don't believe, and it would have required the appointment of a guardian ad litem for any unrepresented minor who had an EPO filed um, and established protocols for proceeding against minor respondents who violate an order of protection. And one more that I would like to go over in child welfare uh, that we did not see move, but was in a discussion among advocates uh, is Senate Bill 143. Um, the bill attempted to address the recent changes to extended foster care in Kentucky that were made during the 2022 session um, in the all-inclusive Senate Bill 8. Uh, Senate Bill 143 would have removed the 90-day waiting period for young adults to opt in and out of extended commitment. Um, and the bill did not move due to some conflicts of, you know, perception uh, between advocates and um, agencies. So hopeful that that topic is brought back up again and um, some resolution is made there next session. And I will pass it over to Corinna. Thanks, Tamara. Um, so similar to others, we saw several missed opportunities this session when it came to economic security. Um, but I'm just as excited to talk about them with y'all today um, because I really do see all three of these policies as both really important for kids and families and also really exciting opportunities for next legislative session. So the first op missed opportunity is eviction expungement. This is a bill that Senator Julie Rocky Adams filed and Senator West Whitney Westerfield played a huge part in crafting that would have created a process to automatically take evictions off of family records after a certain amount of time, as well as sealed eviction filings. So right now, families who have an eviction on a record or even had an eviction filed against them have a really hard time finding future housing. A lot of landlords won't take tenants with past evictions. Um, so this would have created really a second chance for families to find housing stability 
um, by taking those evictions off the record after a certain amount of time. The next policy I'm going to talk about is paid family leave, which unfortunately we did not see a bill for this session. Um, Representative Samara Hedren did a lot of work in the interim to come up with frameworks around paid family leave and what that could look like in Kentucky. But like I said, unfortunately, that did not materialize into any type of bill. Um, the last policy I'll talk about is expanded unemployment insurance for victims of domestic violence. This is a bill that was sponsored by Representative Cole Carney and Representative Hebron that would have made it easier for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking to access unemployment insurance if the reason for their unemployment was related to their interpersonal violence situation. This would have been a really huge help um, allowing families to gain economic stability while they kind of rebuild their life, heal from the trauma that interpersonal violence brings um, and kind of establish themselves in a safer community. And with that, I will pass it over to Sarah. So this year on the blueprint, we had one predominant education item, and that again was um, banning corporal punishment, which did not um, get traction in this session. This is a bill that has made multiple appearances in past sessions for many, many reasons, but predominantly just finding different ways to uh, discipline children in the public school system other than resorting to a physical punishment. And so since we did not get traction this session, I know that many advocates are looking to discuss this topic again in the future, and I don't expect it to go away anytime soon. Tamara, do you have any health related issues you would like to discuss? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, so as far as health policy priorities, we didn't see any significant efforts um, to mitigate the youth vaping crisis during this session. House Bill 310 hinted at holding tobacco retailers accountable for underage sales, but it did not provide comprehensive guidelines for enforcing tobacco sales to youth, such as like tobacco retail licensing. Um, House Bill 370 suggested applying harsher punishments when kids purchase, use, or possess tobacco products underage, and uh, that is a strategy that has been proven ineffective in reducing teen vaping. So hopefully next session um, we we see this topic brought up more and addressed more appropriately. So I know that um, when we talk about missed opportunities, opportunities, um, some of us talked about our excitement about 2024. Uh, it is a budget session. It is a longer session. And um, it also, I think, uh, will bring some um, some struggles. Um, but we also are uh, hopeful that we'll, we'll have additional conversation and opportunity to um, to talk to legislators about those key issues that we've uplifted um, during both the 2023 session and prior to that. So I would love to hear from folks um, both, you know, what do you hope the General Assembly learned um, as a lesson during the 2023 session? And and how, what do you think uh, we will see for 2024? Or what do you hope to see for 2024? I, Shannon, I will start this one off. I am so excited about the 2024 session because it is basically going to be the year of early childhood. Think, think about that now. Early childhood education taking full front. This year, we lose federal funding, one-time federal funds, and the stabilization payments that were granted to us through the American Rescue Plan. And so child care programs are going to be extremely vulnerable and at risk of collapse as far as the weak infrastructure that they have already held. But as the appropriation session moves forward in 2024, we are going in with the recommendations of last summer's or last year's early childhood task force. And we have high hopes that the Kentucky legislature will understand the importance of child care for the entire state's economy and realize that in order to make sure that the rest of our state can go to work, that working families have to have safe and healthy child care. And so that, that will be a big focus for our organization and many other advocates as we approach the 2024 session. Um, I'll hop in if that's okay. Uh, one of the things I think uh, 
I'll kind of transition a little bit. Um, I'll talk about, I think, a lesson that I think the legislature could learn from this session and then uh, kind of transition into like how that applies to what I'm looking forward to. But, you know, I noticed a lot of bills that didn't move or just a lot of involvement this year from into, like folks with lived experience. And I don't just mean child welfare, right? We saw that a lot with Senate Bill 150 and all of the groups and advocates that were there for that. Um, so I think one of the lessons to be learned by our representatives is that you can't silence the people um, and that individuals with lived experience, you know, they're going to speak up for for things that are affecting them in their lives. Um, so and, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of that next session with child welfare and with other areas. Um, I'm also looking forward to a, a focus on mental health for our young people uh, in foster care and their caregivers. Um, because I think that's something that that is come out in research that that needs more focus in Kentucky. Um, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to having a potential priority on that. We, we shall see. Hey, I can hop in next. Um, kind of the first part of the question on what do I hope the General Assembly took away as a lesson learned from this session? I really hope they took away that Kentucky ideas and voices need to be driving policies that are made here in Kentucky. Terry kind of stole my thunder in the beginning. Um, but like you mentioned, over the last several legislative sessions, we've seen a real rise of kind of one size fits all legislation written and pushed by large national groups with large budgets. We're very unfamiliar with Kentucky and what Kentuckians need. And I hope that as we reflect on this past session and look ahead to the upcoming budget session, that the General Assembly will prioritize policies that really address the unique needs and struggles of Kentuckians, because as we all know, we are not a one-size-fits-all state, um, not even one-size-fits-all school system, county, um, very different as you go across Kentucky. Um, what I'm excited for in this upcoming session it's kind of what I alluded to in the missed opportunities. I'm really excited about the possibility to see eviction expungement come back up um, and really get that one over the finish line. Excited to see paid family leave um, and unemployment for victims of interpersonal violence make a comeback and hopefully also get over the finish line for those pieces of legislation. Um, I'm really also excited by, Sarah alluded to it, but there was a public benefits task force last year during the interim session and then there was that resolution that really focused on ways to address the benefits cliff. And one thing that came out that we saw a lot of focus on was the earned income tax credit. It has been a KY priority for far longer than I've been here, than probably a lot of us on this call have been here, um, to get a state earned income tax credit or just find ways to promote and really strengthen that support. So really excited to see where that resolution goes and strengthening the earned income tax credit and where possibilities lie in this next budget session. Um, so to add on to what Corinne and others have already said, um, one thing that I hope the General Assembly takes away this session is just the importance of discussion and particularly getting input on bills from those in the community or in the spaces of whom that bill is going to impact. Um, I personally saw how powerful and how meaningful conversations with the community can be this session. And so I wanted to share one really positive example of that that I got to see. Um, so that comes out of a group that I help lead, which is called Reform Louisville. And this is a group of young adults who at some point have been impacted by the justice system, and they are truly seeking positive policy change for youth and young adults who enter the justice system. Um, and so at some point later in the session, we were actually able to meet with Senator Westerfield. Um, and, you know, going into it, it was just so late in the session, we were kind of telling our young adults like, hey, um, we're excited to meet with him, but like, this is really far in the session, this bill is advancing, we're not sure how much like, this conversation is actually going to do or change, if anything. Um, but we went into the session, and they went in and they shared their stories. Um, and through that conversation, mm -hmm. Senator Westerfield actually started um, like it sparked an idea within him. And so he started to start writing a floor amendment um, that the reform Louisville young adults kind of helped um, shape that idea and ex through their express stories um, and through them expressing the importance of kids having just positive things to do in their community. Um, and so I think the biggest takeaway from that is that through meaningful conversations, 
and engagement with communities, we can find a common ground. Um, there's always a common ground and that should be doing what is best for all of Kentucky's kids and families. Um, and so this next session, I'm really looking forward to and hope to see more community engagement between um, state lawmakers and communities in which they're making decisions on behalf of. Thanks for that, Crystal. And I think um, Kentucky Youth Advocates and the Blueprint for Kentucky's Children, along with Bloom Kentucky, is hoping to also practice what we're preaching, which is going across the state, listening to folks um, in, uh, in different communities across the Commonwealth to get a better understanding of what is on the minds of um, everyone from pastors to teachers to um uh, young people with lived experience to birth parents and uh, kind of everything in between. So in the coming weeks, you'll see some information come out related to the Sewing Resilience Bloom Kentucky listening tours. And we're really excited to be in your city or in your county or in your town or in your li public library uh, where we are going to um, to listen and hear from folks as far as what's on their mind for 2024, uh, both from their legislators and also from the gubernatorial candidates. So we're really excited um, to to move forward with that and hear and, um, and, and learn um, as we go forward and prepare for the 2024 session and the election that is coming. Coming. Um, we so appreciate you all tuning in and being on and digging in uh, a little bit more to the priorities and um, appreciate you um, engaging in the blueprint for Kentucky's children. Thank you.